we serve a passionate God. And there's something about the idea that God is remote and distant that uh, does a couple of things. One, it says, well, maybe I can hide. <laughs> if he's remote and distant, maybe he doesn't really pay attention to, you know, what I know is crummy inside of me. So that's one side of it. The other side of it is, is maybe he doesn't care that the details of my life and the things that are going on in my life, that he doesn't notice those either. And either one of them lead us into really dangerous pathways because we serve a God who is passionate, but who really sees and cares. I had a conversation with a relatively new parent uh, over the last few days and just the absurdity of this guy looking at his children and not having just overflowing love over them because they tripped and fell on the playground or they talked back to each other, they slapped their sister, that there would ever be the presumption that I'm not just as loved by dad all the way is so preposterous. It's preposterous. Anybody who's a parent knows what it means to love their children knows that it's preposterous. But yet, yeah, that's exactly how we think about our father much of the time. We think that he's looking at us and with disapproval, or he's looking at us to catch us when we trip up, or that our issues are so overwhelming to him that we must be fatally flawed in the eyes of our father. I know you're all, you're saying like I'm being extravagant or exaggerating, but it's not an exaggeration. We really have such a perverse view of the nature and character of our Father much of the time, whose scripture is very clear that though he is righteous and just and pure and holy, and that his light is perfect light and in him is no darkness at all, all that is absolutely true. But it's also true, as the prophetic word said this morning, that he looks at you with love. And he models for you such extravagant love that you have no reason not to draw on that and give it away to everyone just as extravagantly as he's given it to you. And it's amazing. So the encouragement this morning is that I felt from the Holy Spirit is though his love is intense, don't withdraw from his love. Sometimes intimacy is kind of intimidating. Sometimes it's like I want to pull away. And we saw that in the Old Testament because during the wandering around the wilderness, God shows up in Sinai and he shows up in his presence and he shows up. It's fearsome. It's trembling and it's earthquakes and there's lightning and thunder and there's all this stuff. And everybody's like, Whoa. I'm okay with the God who's love, but I'm not so sure I'm okay with the God who's all powerful. So I recoil, I back away. I'm afraid of the intensity of his passion on all sides. And the encouragement today is don't back off from what the Holy Spirit has for you today. I totally believe that Holy Spirit has an agenda with each and every one of us. Every time we come together, we have an opportunity to tune ourselves to hear what the Holy Spirit wants to say specifically to you today. You maybe you already heard it. Maybe it was in worship. I just encourage you to grab on to whatever that is that the Holy Spirit is saying to you and hold on to it for dear life because it's the word of the Lord for you. I had a, a little confession. I'm a, I'm a hard sleeper. I like to sleep. I mean, I, I usually get my seven, eight hours and I'm out, right? I'm gone. I sleep hard. And uh, I woke up at 3.30 this morning dreaming. I also dream a lot, which it seems like kind of contradictory, but I, I woke up to 3.30 this morning and I was remembering my dream. And I'm like, I'm trying to lean into God more for different ways he's speaking to me. But in this case, it means getting up at 3.30 and trying to write down what I remember of the dream. And so I have a victory, right? I actually got up at 3.30 and wrote down what I remembered of the dream. That God is speaking to us and he wants to draw us into something deeper in him. It might be inconvenient, but it's like what I'm encouraging you about holding on to the voice of God and what the Holy Spirit is saying to you this morning. I can't very well encourage you to do that. And then when he's trying to speak to me in my dreams, not get up and write them down. It's all part of the same thing of leaning into his presence and what he specifically wants to say to you. Amen. Be sensitive to the Holy Spirit. He's going to direct you into the lives and needs of others. He's going to move you out of your own comfort zone. He's going to move you into uncomfortable places, but they're places that are going to have his presences and anointing, and you're going to have opportunities to give away the goodness of God in your life. We're on a Sonship series. We've had several so far. There, You can find them on our House of Glory YouTube channel, House of Glory Hilo on YouTube, and you'll find that. You can also find it on Rumble, but it's under Central Christian Church. We have several topics on this. The last one we did was, don't you want to know him? 
And I hope there's a hunger in your hearts to know him more. He's inviting and he's drawing and he's beckoning us into an intimate relationship with him. More deep than you know, more close than you know. He's more in your favor. He's more fond of you than you know. And it makes a difference. A scared world needs a fearless church, A.W. Tozer said. We live in a pretty scared, wor scared world. Perfect love casts out fear. So there we have this theme carrying on that perfect love casts out fear. We live in a scared world that needs us to represent the kind of love that only God can give. Additionally, a frustrated creation needs sons and daughters to reflect their father. We've shared this before, but in Romans it says that all creation is groaning for the manifestation of sons of God. Sons and daughters of God. Sons and daughters of God are those who hear the Holy Spirit, who listen and obey. A couple key scriptures. It's become my inspiration and passion and ministry to labor with a tireless intensity, with his power flowing through me to present to every believer the revelation of being his perfect one in Jesus Christ. Colossians 1.22 says, You are holy and blameless as you stand before him without a single fault. And if that's not what you say about yourself, then you're saying about yourself something different than what he says about you, clearly. We confront that a little bit today. John 3.16 and 1 John 4.16, And we have known and believed the love that God has for us. God is love. He who abides in love abides in God and guide in him. And then personalize the same verse. We say, And I know and I believe the love that my Father has for me. My Father is love. As I abide in love, I abide in my Father and my Father in me. So the challenge is, as it says on the bottom, so live like you're loved. So live like you're loved that much. I was challenged. I think I was last night. We we're coming down from the mountain after the prayer time. And I was just thinking about how we pray kind of funny sometimes. Father God, Lord Jesus, Yahweh, Jehovah. Like all this in our same prayer, right? All these different. We dress in the Holy Spirit. We dress in Jesus. Sometimes it gets a little confusing. Different people speaking Hebrew names. And I, and I just was re reflecting that how did Jesus say we're to pray? He said, yeah, it's, it's Abba. It's our Father. We're making our requests and we're trusting a Father whose heart is good and who's poised towards you and who loves you so much. And that's who we're making our requests to. So if there's any confusion, and sometimes it, I'm not saying from a scholarly or theological perspective, it's not valid to question how it is that we refer to God and where is the word Jehovah come from and Yahweh. And, and it's, a, it's an interesting conversation. But if we do what Jesus says, we're kind of safe. We're, we're just talking to Abba. We're talking to Daddy Father. We're talking to the one who it puts us in the disposition to receive of an overflowing, compassionate, loving Father who looks at you, whose heart explodes. Any of you who aren't parents, you'll know what I mean someday. But your heart can just explode in love for another human being. And that's how God looks at you. So live like your love. The Father's mission, if you would choose to accept it, to form in you his nature, that you would perfectly reflect him. Any takers willing to be conformed to the image by his grace and mercy and his sanctification and his working inside of us so that what comes out is just like Jesus, which Jesus says, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. So if we get to it looks just like Jesus, we get to it just looks just like God. And he wants to reflect himself through you. And so it leads to our worldview. We are to live as sons and daughters, identifying with the ascension, meaning Jesus seated at the right hand of the throne of the Father, who didn't just die and raise again, but ascended to be seated with the Father. It starts with acceptance. We're never striving or attaining to earn our way to the heart of the Father. I've heard and I believe in how good my Father is to me. So there's a worldview. There's a declaration you could make daily that puts you in the right place to agree with what God says about you. So today's topic, what says the potter? What does the potter say? Our sonship number seven. I just have a few verses on here because where I feel like the Holy Spirit wants us to press into today is that he wants to propel and declare into our lives and to set as a church and to set for you as individuals what his purpose and his declaration, what he's declaring and de decreeing over you. He makes the decrees because he's the king. And we declare what he decrees. So we make our declarations in line with his decrees. We're in safe territory to declare over our lives what he says. I want to get to today. But what does the potter say? This scripture stuck out to me as I was reading in Isaiah. This first verse and then this one in Isaiah chapter 50. Isaiah 26.3. You will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts in you. 
I will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on me, God saying to you today. Isaiah 26, 3. He will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on him because we trust in him. The way I wanted to start this section of the message today is just to reflect on what does that feel like? Anybody think perfect peace sounds like a pretty cool thing to have? What does it feel like? And I find myself needing this all the time. I say this, I, I wake up oftentimes thinking of this verse. I go to bed thinking about this verse because I let my mind get caught up into all sorts of things that really aren't being stayed on him. And so I lose peace. And when I lose peace, it's like the alarms are going off. Just bugging the crud out of you until you're like, hey, where did my peace go? Like I've just been busy and forgot to keep my mind on him. How is it possible to keep my mind on him throughout the day? So just could take a sec. So what I want you to do, just close your eyes for a minute. Breathe in the presence of God through your nose. Hold it for five seconds and exhale through your mouth. We'll do it three times. And as you breathe, I just want you to look at this loving father that I've painted this picture for you. I want you to look into the eyes of a loving father. And when you look into his eyes, I want you to see bright and intense eyes. And they look with you with favor. I just want you to look into his eyes. Look into the face of Jesus. Look into the face of your loving father. And then let it settle you in your stomach, all the way down to your core. You're loved and you matter. You're loved and you matter, says the creator of the universe. You're loved and you matter, says the father who loves you with passion and intensity. And it looks at you and thinks of only positive thoughts of a future and a hope. That's what it says in Jeremiah. You're looking at the eyes of a loving father who, in Psalm 139, says his thoughts towards you are good thoughts. And they're like the sand on the seashore. I don't want you to feel peace. Perfect peace only comes from the Father. And if you can hold on to that while you open your eyes and we go into the next scripture. But this is the challenge. We get quiet in order to link on and get our eyes connected and to get this constant abiding fellowship that he wants for us. And then we hold on to that through whatever else we're doing. And we practice that until we can hold his presence and preach a message. We can hold his presence and listen to what the Holy Spirit wants to say to you going on this conversation going on while this conversation is going on. That you hold on to that at your workplace and you hold on to that when you're traveling to and fro and you hold on to that when it's time to rest and quiet your mind before you sleep and you say, God, I just submit my subconscious to you. Have your way in my life as I go to sleep tonight. And we just practice this being in his presence. So that's what perfect peace feels like. And we just got to practice it. I hope you looked into his loving eyes and felt what that feels like. But acceptance feels awesome. Perfect love casts out fear. Fear is the enemy of peace. We live in a world that spends most of its time trying to conjure up fear of some form or the other. It's a world of rejection and performance and of coercion and compulsion and whatever, right? That's the world that we live in. That's just what one part of us live in, because actually the world that we live in is the kingdom of God. The world that we're citizens are is a place where perfect peace reigns because the will of God is performed perfectly. That's why we pray your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Because the place where we are, citizens of heaven, his will is perfectly, perfectly flows. And his will and his nature is all about his love for you. Right? Everything he does is out of love. So this scripture, Isaiah 45, 9 through 11. Woe to him who strives with his maker. Let the potsherds strive with the potsherds of the earth. Shall the clay say to him who forms it, what are you making? Or shall your handiwork say, he has no hands? Woe to him who says to his father, what are you begetting? Or to the woman, what have you brought forth? Thus says the Lord, the Holy One of Israel and his maker, ask me of things to come concerning my sons and concerning the work of my hands. You command me. So God's doing this, okay, you want a duel? Kind of like in Job. He's like, okay, you just show me, Mr. Smart Guy, where the wind came from. Why don't you just show me who holds the whole world in their hands? Come on, man, let's ante up here because I'm showing up to duel. And the potter is saying the same thing to the pot. The pot strives it up and saying, who do you think you are? My potter has no hands. He can't be the one who formed me. And God comes up and he says, well, why don't you just tell me, why don't you declare what my heart and my intent is for my sons? Why don't you tell me what the purpose of this pot is? This is my pot. This is my son and my daughter that I form. Who knows how long, right? Maybe, maybe he spent millions of years forming that because time doesn't matter to God. Maybe he just spent that much time thinking about how to create this pot. And the pot's going to stand up and say something to the potter contrary to what the potter says. 
God's calling you out. He's calling you out. He's saying, okay, so you can tell me what the future holds. You can tell me he holds the wind in his hands. Why don't you, Mr. Smart Guy, Mr. Smart Girl, my son and daughter who are a little big for your britches, why don't you tell me what it is my intent is and what I've made you for? Sounds kind of humorous, but he's not being humorous. He's saying, woe to the person who stands up and says, I defy you to tell me who I am. Isaiah 45, 9 through 11. Humility is believing what he says about me. But then in this verse, it's woe to me if I don't. So what picture does that paint of God? Is that paint of God who says, if you don't do it my way, I'm going to whack you? Or does it point us to a God who says, let me make it as clear as possible. Let me roll out the red carpet. Let me pay the price for you. Let me demonstrate extravagant love. Let me, while you're running away in your sin, without a glance to your creator, without a glance towards the potter, while you're that pot shirt saying, who the heck are you? I don't think there's anybody up there with any hands that could form and create me with intricate intent and love. I don't think so. And he says, while we were yet sinners, Christ chose to demonstrate his love towards us. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for the ungodly. We have this massive contrast because he says this is the way of life but there's lots of other places that you're free to go your free will can take you this way and take but but hey don't look at me if when you run into a wall on that side and you fall off a cliff on that side and when you run into heartbreak on that side here's what i'm telling you that this carpet never it never leaves the red carpet is always right here where it is it's always provided right here. And I'll sit here and I'll beckon and I'll call. And I'll wait for you when you're being a prodigal. I'll wait for you. The scripture says of the prodigal son that when he came to his senses, he returned. When he returned to his senses, he's like, even the servants have got it better than I have. Doing what I have. I got all the money. I got all the relationships. I got sex, sex drugs, and rock and roll. And I'm just living it up. And I end up in the pig pen like he told me I would. Because I chose this path. But God's sitting here, the loving Father, saying, It's right here. It's right here. The red carpet is right here, calling us back to that place that leads to life. So this is the loving Father. Woe to you is, it is going to be woe to me if I choose a path other than the path that he created me for, that he destined me to. This is where I find fulfillment. This is where I find my purpose. This is where I get a dream and a passion. I get it from the potter. I get it from the one who made me. I seek him. Because there's an awful lot of people screaming and hollering. Where is the father's voice? What kind of voice is that? Still small voice. But we sure got a lot of not so still small voices speaking into our lives about what success means, what eternity looks like, if there is one. A lot of things screaming at us about who you are and what makes you matter. And if we listen to those voices... In contrast to this one, it's woe unto us. So it's a stark warning. It's a challenge. It's, uh, okay, smarty pants, you tell me, right? You show me who it is that formed you from the beginning. If you're going to challenge me. And so my submission to you is that if we will see humility as agreeing with him about what he says about us, knowing that we're loved and knowing that we matter, I think I preach the same message all the time. Second point, sons and daughters embrace his judgment. Sons and daughters embrace his judgment. That may seem crazy. 1 Peter 4, 17. For the time has come for judgment to begin at the house of God. And if it begins with us first, what will be the end of those who do not obey the gospel of God? Same kind of thought, isn't it? Earlier in the same chapter, 1 Peter 4 says, Therefore, since Christ suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourselves also with the same mind. For he who has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. Ponder for just a second. Pause for just a second. He who has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. What does that mean? Verse 2. That he no longer should live the rest of his time in the flesh for the lusts of men, but for the will of God. We've spent enough of our past lifetime in doing the will of the Gentiles. When we walked in the lewdness and lusts and drunkenness and revelries, drinking parties and abominable idolatries. Say enough already. 
In regard to these, they think it strange that you do not run with them in the same flood of dissipation, speaking evil of you. They will give an account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. So the point is, is that sons and goddess of God embrace his judgment. Because the first verse says, once we've died in the flesh, that we're dead to sin. And that's just a beautiful, beautiful promise. It's what's promised in water baptism. Repent, be baptized, be filled with the Holy Spirit. Water baptism, we die with him. It says if we're buried with him in baptism, the same power that raised Christ from the dead then dwells in us. As we come up out of that waters of baptism, it's a brand new creature. If you haven't been water baptized yet, please see us. We're happy to get another one scheduled very soon. We love to do it after our lesson four of our encounter series. So can ask us about that too. But lesson four is about water baptism because it is such a powerful sacrament. And when you believe and you have faith for all of what the scripture says water baptism provides for you, but this is what it is. It means that I've died to sin. I've died to the man that was raised up with these appetites and my spirit has been renewed and changed to desire the things, to thirst for the things, to crave those things that God intended me to crave. He intended you to crave for certain things. It's just been sidetracked so that we crave for things that provide only temporary when what he wants us to do is to crave him, the water, he who gives living water, he who gives the bread that if you eat of, you'll never hunger again. That's what he's built you to crave for is his presence. He's built you to say, oh my gosh, I wouldn't want to walk a step away from your presence. Moses said the same thing in the Old Testament. He says, man, if you don't go with you, I'm not going. It's all great that you send and you have all these promises. You go defeat the enemies in front of us and clear the land in front of us. But if you're not going, I'm not going. This is what we're supposed to crave for. The godly craving to crave what's true and what's just and what's lovely. What's of good report. If there's any virtue, if there's any praise, that's what we're to think on. That's what we're to move towards. That's what naturally he's built us to move into. The fruits of the spirit are not something to attain to. They're natural expressions of a change of being. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, meekness, temperance, faith. Those are the byproducts of Jesus Christ living inside and working his nature out of us. It's not something to reach to. Gosh, I need to be more loving. I need to be more kind. I need to speak more. It's not something to reach to. It's something to let come out of who God's recreated you to be. Amen. Amen. So he who has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. God's judgment, we're all told that we're not supposed to judge. There's two different Greek words that reflect on what judgment is in the New Testament. One's krino and one's dikrino. And one is judgment to life and one is judgment to death. And when he says, don't you dare judge lest you be judged. Don't you dare sit there in that position and get on your high horse and declare of somebody else and prophesy over them death. when what God has prophesied over them is life. When God judges me, he judges me to burn out that which is going to lead me into another brick wall, another pit, another broken cistern that doesn't satisfy. When God judges me, he reigns in my heart and he re redirects my steps. When God judges me, he prunes off those branches that I'm fond of, perhaps, but that don't produce fruit in my life. When God judges me, when a heavenly father judges me, when a God who loves me judges me, that I'm, my best response is like David. Created me a clean heart, O oh God, and renew a right spirit within me. I know your judgment is good. And if you've had, don't assume it. <laughs> There's a lot of broken relationships and a lot of pain because not all of us, Father, reflect the Father perfectly. And causes harms to our kids. And maybe you're come from relationships like that. That it's very difficult to look at a loving Father because you don't have that experience. But God says you have a loving father. And when he comes and he wants to bring adjustment and correction, you can trust that the heart of your father is good for you. And that everything that he does in your life will work together for your good. It's a promise. Because it's consistent with his nature and character. Better lock on to what his nature and character is. If you think he's aloof and removed, you're going to live a certain way. If you think he's passionate and involved and loving, it's going to cause you to live in a certain way. That's why I say, live like you're loved. And confront that inside of me that believes opposite. Because there are things inside of you and there are things inside of me that don't believe about God, what he says about him. And there's things in you that you believe about you that aren't what he says about you. 
And if humility is to say, I believe about what he says about me, then what is the most arrogant thing we could do in opposition? How about we dare to say about ourselves? How about woe to us if we dare to say about ourselves something that he doesn't say? So let it confront you. When you open the word, let it confront you. When you say, I don't really believe that, let it confront you. And then say, God, would you change my mind? Would you renew my mind so that I see the way that you see? Because I got all this baggage that I'm carrying. I got all these hurts. I got these things that are glasses which I review my life because they've been my life experience. Can you give me new glasses? Can you replay those tapes from my past that are full of pain and hurt and disappointment and rejection? Can you replay those tapes and show me where you were at in the very midst of those? How can a good God allow such and such to happen? But it's like the footprints in the sand. Really, truly, he's carrying us through all those situations and he will use those moments of despair. He will use those moments of despair and he does use them for your good. Because he was there just as much in the despair as he is when things are good. David was made a king because there was a Goliath. David was a king because he spent 13 years ducking from cave to cave from a jealous king. And it formed in him through despair and through running here to there and fearing for his life. It created something inside of him that made him king worthy showed him the nature of God that he was to represent as the monarch over the land. Boy, you better understand what it looks like if you're going to represent God for an entire nation. And so he did. And then the warning. There's light and then there's light. Isaiah 50, 10 through 11. Who among you has true fear and reverence of Yahweh? Who of you listens to the voice of his servant? Or any of you groping in the dark without light? Trust in the faithful name of Yahweh and rely on your God. But if you presume to light your own torch, you are playing with fire. So go ahead. Walk in the light of your own fires and the sparks you have kindled. But I can promise you this. It will take you down into torment. Sound a little bit like, whoa. <laughs> It'll lead us into torment. There's light and then there's light. And God says, know what the true light is. You have to know what the true light is. Because if you're creating your own artificial light, your own man-made light, your own ideas about how life will work, your own ideas about how to make other people do what you want them to do, right? Your own ideas for material success, your own ideas of what success is. You're holding up your own light. This little light of mine, this is what I'm living for. This is what illuminates my path. And he says, can you just stop for a second? Would you just stop for a second? And would you look at what the source of light is? I am the one who spoke light and it was. I am the light of the world, Jesus says. In him, there is no darkness at all, the word says of our father. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am the light, and I am the life. And there's no way you're going to find the father except through me. This is Jesus' word. So there's light, and then there's light. And the woe is, don't hold up your own light. We're living in a system of a bunch of man-made ideas, much of it coercive. But we're living in a whole world that's attempting to create a, a one world government. And if that's the world you want, don't do anything. Just keep going. Okay, that's where it's going to go. But if you want a different world that says that your will be done on earth as it is in heaven, his will is freedom and liberty and light. But we better know what the true light looks at because there's a lot of people holding up a false light. And God's saying, you better look at the real light. Look at the true light. Amen. Our Father is mighty to save. His light is the true light, Isaiah 49, 23. Kings shall be your foster fathers and the queens your nursing mothers. They shall bow down to you with their faces to the earth and lick up the dust of your feet. Then you will know that I am the Lord. And note this last sentence. This is actually what stood out to me. For they shall not be ashamed who wait for me. The Passion Translation says, they will not be ashamed whose hearts are entwined with me. That word wait is a really special word, essentially to be bound together by twisting. To wait on the Lord means to be like bound together with him, entwined with him. You won't be ashamed who choose to let your heart be bound to the one true, to the one true light, to the one who is the one true father. Just make sure you know what he actually looks like and then bind your heart to him. You won't be ashamed.